opposition that all he could do was cover himself with glory in defeat. Accent on Vienna. A settlement even before the Romans came, Austria's capital grew in size and beauty through the centuries. And today its central landmark is St. Stephen's Cathedral. Historic pictures taken some 50 years ago reveal a glimpse of bygone splendor as Franz Josef, Emperor of Austria and King of Hungary, walks in Vienna near the end of his long reign. The old emperor died in 1916. And it was not long afterwards that from the strains and stresses of World War I, the empire began to break up. After the Habsburgs, Austria became a republic. And in the early 1930s, the diminutive Chancellor Dolphus forcibly suppressed revolts inspired by the Nazis. Pitched battles were fought, and an attempt on the life of Dolphus was made in 1933. Next year, he was assassinated by Austrian Nazis disguised as members of the Heimwehr troops. Prince Stardenberg, a Heimwehr leader, was one of the chief mourners. Pictures of the funeral procession recall this deadly blow to Austria's hopes of maintaining independence. Schuschnigg tried, but failed to withstand the pressure from Nazi Germany. In 1938, he had to report virtual capitulation to Hitler's demands. Nazis were now included in his cabinet, the chief being Seisinkart. Clearly, Vienna was already full of Nazis. On March the 13th, 1938, vast crowds massed in the streets as Hitler came in with his troops to occupy Vienna. The infamous dictator had anticipated Schuschnigg's plan to hold an immediate plebiscite. He now proclaimed the union of Austria with Germany. Seventeen years on. The great bell of St. Stephen's rings out that Austria is free at last. There were very friendly greetings for the foreign ministers of the four powers as they drove to the Belvedere Castle. Here, where Chancellor Schuschnigg was imprisoned by Hitler, the delegates now enter to be greeted by Chancellor Raab. Mr. Molotov, Soviet Russia. Mr. Macmillan, Britain's new Foreign Secretary. Mr. Dallas, America's Secretary of State. And Monsieur Pinet, France. Then the historic moment, the signing of the treaty. Russia's agreement, after all the years of argument, is a source of great satisfaction to the Western powers. After Monsieur Pinet, Austria's Foreign Minister Fiegel signs. Each minister then made a brief speech. Mr. Macmillan. It has fallen to me today that signing this long-awaited treaty in the name of the Queen, my gracious sovereign. The treaty making Austria a free neutral provides for the departure of all occupation troops by the end of this year. And it has proved that the complicated problem of the eastern oil fields was capable of solution. Also the question of shipping on the Danube. All Russian held property and rights are to be handed back within two months. When the treaty had been signed, leading delegates appeared on the balcony of the castle to exchange greetings with the crowd outside. A joyful moment indeed. 17 years of occupation is a very long time.